Let's take a couple of uh, audience questions here, if, if you don't mind. Um, a couple questions for Dr. Dickens based on his response to my question around process development. Um, question, uh, is that a, a process with co-capping or enzymatic capping? Dr. Dickens, can you uh, respond to that? Yep. So we use a clean cap in our particular process, which is currently single source due to the IP and things of that nature. We, we do use a clean cap. Uh, proprietary cap in our in our process that's included okay. within the IVT reaction um, so that's how that's incorporated yep okay yeah uh question around scalability which was going to be where i took the conversation next anyway so I'll, I'll take that one does the panel see any scalability concerns given the large quantities of organic solvents required in current manufacturing dr gins if you want to start with that and then we'll maybe uh see if roberta can chime in yeah sure so, um oh go ahead Oh, go ahead. I, I was just going to say, we, we haven't experienced many supply chain issues, but I don't think being at an institute where we do an out of one of one GMP campaign or an engineering campaign and, a, and one GMP campaign to supply our clinical, a clinical early phase clinical trials, really not that representative of the commercial landscape. Um, so we haven't experienced the supply and dis disruptions, but having said that, we recognize that there are a couple of raw materials within this landscape that are single sourced and things of that nature. Mm -hmm. Okay, R Roberta, did you want to chime in on that one, or sure if that was Roberta or yeah, Doctor Joe? Okay. Yeah. So, um, you know, supply chain actually has been a bit of a challenge from raw materials um, with everything going on with COVID and the massive in, um, effort in developing and and manufacturing COVID vaccines, we've seen that with warp speed, the supply chain has become challenging and a lot of raw materials and consumables have long lead time. So that does have an implication. Um, our team has done a great job of working around that and continuing to work around that, but it is a, a bit of a challenge that is part of the, the process we're dealing with today. Mm -hmm. Transparency okay. is a challenge. I want to uh, pose a question to our audience. Uh, let, let's let's take polling question number one. So this question is for our audience. We're going to present uh, to you um, a, a very basic question and ask for your response. What is the future for mRNA? Your options are it will replace cell-derived therapeutics and vaccines, such as monoclonal antibodies and recombinant proteins. Or mRNA will be complementary to other biologics and small molecule therapies. Or it's a trend. It's a passing fad. It will go away. Uh, take a minute to respond to that survey. Uh, we're going to revisit the response to that survey here shortly. Um, I can see where this one's going already. <laughs> While our audience is responding to the survey, uh, or the polling questions, that is, I'd like to get our panelists uh, to put their forward-looking thinking caps on and tell us what greater scallop challenges you anticipate the industry will face as more mRNA candidates approach late clinical and commercialization stages. So, you know, we've talked about supply chain disruptions as um, more players get in on the game. I anticipate that that might be a, a scallop challenge, but what other uh, scallop challenges do you anticipate as we move towards late clinical and commercialization? Um, Roberta, since you're on the screen, is that something you'd like to take a stab at? Yeah, so I think maybe I'll, I'll position it a little bit differently. So when we think about the supply chain piece um, and raw materials being a challenge today, the other challenge is actually developing mRNA vaccines at room temperature, right? So it's about um, how you then develop the manufacturing processes that happens to your formulation um, and also where are you going in a larger scale um, manufacturing capability if you can move away from cold chain where everyone is today. Mm -hmm. So there are, there are several benefits to getting to uh, room temperature, but there are several challenges with mRNA to get there. So as we think about supply chain, it's how do we exist within this moment? And then how do we begin to build in um, those efficiencies that give greater stability at, at room temperature? So much to do in this space, a lot of work to do. Yeah. Dr. Joe, would you would you agree? Anything you'd add to that list? Yeah, so we leverage a lot of uh, GMP manufacturing uh, from CMOs. And then uh, at first uh, we, we uh, like two years ago, there's not many CMO out there that can uh, do MRA work. And then uh, now with uh, COVID vaccine, 
uh, production, we see more and more CMO entering this space. And then uh, two is the capacity of at CMO. So at first there's only like up to 10 gram per batch. Now the most of the CMO uh, or more mature CMO can actually do much larger size. So we do see a, a very positive trend there that there's a more capacity to support MRA manufacturing, but still a lot of limitation there. Uh, one is the, you know, how do we convert in the existing, say, uh, mo most of CMO that's a uh, uh, biologics, right, a protein therapeutic, how do we convert that CMO uh, into uh, be able to uh, produce MRAs and you know, training and uh, environment control and so on, and then personnel training, and then two, basically, uh, supply chain wise, we're still facing a lot of uh, pressure there. So uh, we are a rare disease company. We uh, have to uh, uh, stay on the second line, uh, you know, not to compete with uh, COVID vaccine production for sure. So uh, uh, how to expand that the capacity to meet all the MRE demand that's still uh, to be seen. And then uh, raw material wise, it's uh, still quite expensive. And then uh, raw material uh, causes uh, most uh, some in some area account for oh, more than fifty percent of cost of goods. So uh, we do want to see because we are um, developing this rare disease uh, uh, therapeutics. We do want to have a reasonable pricing to ensure a broader access. So how to address uh, cost of goods, especially reduce uh, lower the cost of uh, raw material. And the scaling up, that's a, a, another challenge we're facing. Okay. Uh, let's take a look at those poll results, Miles. Can you pull those up for us? We'll just take a, a quick peek at that. Um, so I, I wouldn't find it, uh, I wouldn't call this too surprising, right? mRNA will be complementary to other biologics and small molecule therapies. Although uh, I, I guess I am a little bit surprised if close to 15% see it as replacing. Um, existing cell-derived therapeutics. Uh, what are your thoughts on that, Dr. Joe? Is there any, anything surprising to you there in that poll result? Um, no, not really. And then, uh, so at this point, I, I still feel like MRA is still in its uh, infancy uh, mm -hmm. stage. But in the future, I do see this uh, a great uh, contribution to the uh, to the therapeutic. And then uh, I don't see it uh, replace the whole um, protein therapeutic or ser uh, cellular therapeutic right away. And then until we see a technology really have a breakthrough there. And then, uh, but I'm hopeful that uh, because we, uh, I see the field, we have a lot of investment uh, from all kinds of companies. I do see this uh, field can take off very, very rapidly. And then uh, maybe in the future, it can uh, replace uh, gene therapy or even uh, cellular uh, therapy. Yeah. Uh, Roberta, doc, Dr. Joe mentioned the CMO capacity crunch, uh, you know, and, and this is a capacity that, that, that crunch is affecting so many modalities across so much of, uh, of, of the biopharma space. Uh, but particularly, she mentioned that, you know, M mRNA, not only is there a, a, a crunch for, uh, for, for capa manufacturing capacity, but there's also a, an intellectual property uh, shortage, I'm sure, a, a skill and talent uh, sh shortage uh, in mRNA, given that it's a to Dr. Joe's point in, in its infancy. Um, what, what's your take uh, on the CMO, um, I guess, issue uh, from Sakaris's point of view? Yeah, so Dr. Joe's points are really valid and, and poignant with regard to what we've seen in uh, CMOs be able to come into this space and, and continue to partner really heavily with us. And we've seen with the influx of, of investment over the last uh, year and a half to two years with COVID that CMOs have upskilled in their capabilities. Um, what's really interesting is, is while CMOs can bring volume, there also has been a great investment and an opportunity for CDMOs, which can partner in process development and in the product development space. And that's a space where there's still a lot of opportunity and growth um, to partner with, with industry in order to bring um, the development forward. So uh, while the CMO space has seen a lot of growth and investment, uh, we'll continue to see that as the mRNA space continues to develop in both the prophylactic and prophylactic and therapeutic spaces. So we do see a lot of opportunity there um, and, and also see that it's a great uh, way to partner in the business in order to bring products to market faster.